joining today's workshop on perspective. Perspective is one of the best skills you can have in your toolkit as a Canvas creator. It can make your worlds believable, your characters feel alive, and your fight scenes really land that punch. Today's guest, Professor Hunter Clark, is a master of applying perspective creatively to comics. He's worked with several publishers on fan favorite series, including Gudetama, Adventure Time, Regular Show, Rick and Morty, V and Puppy Cat, and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. As a professor, he leads comics classes, and his former students include several Webtoon Originals creators and Webtoon team members. He's joined us today to give an overview of how to create perspective effectively for your Webtoon scenes. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hunter Clark. Hello, everybody. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, for inviting me and Webtoon for inviting me. I'm so pumped to be here for the Summer Summit today. Kirsten did a great job of introducing me. I don't think there's really a whole lot more I can say about myself, except that I am a working professional cartoonist and illustrator as well. Um, you know, Kirsten kind of laid out uh, everything that I've kind of done, so I'm just gonna go ahead and jump on right in. What I wanna talk about today, as Kirsten mentioned, is perspective. The reason that I think a lot of people struggle with it, and I did myself, um, is because it has to deal a lot of times with math. And a lot of the time, I don't know about y'all or if you feel this way, but I am terrible at math. So I like to kind of approach perspective in a different way. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is more about the concept of how you can apply it to your figures and your worlds because you wanna make them feel believable. What I was gonna talk about though is the relationship between you as a character or your figures in your space and then also the space that you're trying to get across. I'll get, a, I'll get to that here in just a moment, and I'm gonna pull up Clip Studio because today I'm gonna to do almost all of my stuff in Clip Studio. I'm gonna show kind of the ruler tools and how to utilize them. Hopefully, I'm assuming some of y'all, if not, you know, a fair amount of y'all are familiar with these, but if you're not, that's totally okay. I'm just gonna kind of break it down. You know, hopefully we can get to it as we go. So the first thing I wanna talk about specifically is the horizon line. It's something that we all have to have and we all have to utilize and it has to exist in everything before we can kind of figure out perspective as we go. So if you don't mind, just sit back in your chair or stand up wherever you're at in your room, your workplace, wherever you're watching this right now and kind of hold your arms straight out like this right in front of your eyes. When you do this and you go across, Essentially, this is your horizon line when you look outward across in front of you. Your horizon line is your eye line. Everything that exists below it is below it, and everything that exists above it is above it. That makes sense. It's pretty straightforward. What that means, though, is nothing until you find vanishing points, just so you can kind of see me in my room. I'm going to kind of step back or kind of zoom in over here. So if you see me right here, this is where my eye line is right now. I'm sitting down. But you can see this line on the back edge of my room is kind of going up towards this line. This is how I'm going to kind of find a vanishing point as we go. And I know this is kind of silly, but I want you to look at your room or wherever you're sitting or watching this right now and think about these different lines and spaces. So let's say, for example, I want to create the vanishing point right here. I need to establish a vanishing point first. And then what's going to happen is all of my lines that will be in an interior space or an exterior space for this uh, example, I'm just going to do an interior are going to go to or from, and they're going to converge on that point. So I'm just going to grab a straight line tool real quick, and I'm just going to draw a bunch out of there. You can do this with a ruler as well in Clip Studio, and I'll do that and show that here in just a little bit. But to just break it down, I wanted to do this first. So when you're doing this, and I'm gonna drop the opacity on this just a little bit so we can see it, um, I'm gonna just kind of break down and say, all right, here's the vanishing point, here's the horizon line right here, and then I'm gonna block out a cube. I know that the edges and the sides of this are gonna converge and go towards the vanishing point. Sorry for the roughly drawn cube, but that is what it is. All right, so when I'm doing it like this, again, I want you to make sure and you're noticing that the lines are going towards the vanishing point in one point perspective. 
In one point perspective, all these other horizontal and vertical lines that are the edges are going to be just that. They are going to be horizontal and they're going to be vertical. A quick thing just to always remember, and this is just a quick indicator, if you're struggling and trying to figure out, all right, where's my horizon line in my panel or when I'm sketching things out, when you're roughing things out, you can kind of get that quick, clear indication that, all right, let's say you're doing something like this where it's a cylindrical object. If you can see the bottom of that object, that means the horizon line is below that object. If you see the top, of an element of shape or a box, that means the horizon line is above the object itself because you're seeing the top of it. So knowing that and building that out, we can kind of build on top of that. So let me turn some of these off and go to these different shapes. I've already kind of indicated some there, but they apply to actual things you're gonna be drawing in your comics and over and over again in your stories. So. If you're doing characters, if you're doing shots where you're looking down on a figure, and I'm gonna talk about that here in a minute and the way perspective is in context to shot choice as well, um, how you're gonna get that across. If a figure is uh, below the horizon line, we're gonna see more of the top of their head. Same kind of thing, if you're drawing a present, um, if you're seeing a computer being held up from underneath, you're gonna see the underside of it because it exists, again, above the horizon line. So when you think about one point perspective, again, with the horizon and with that singular vanishing point, I want you to think about all of the sides are going and arrows converging on that central vanishing point. Again, horizontals will exist just straight horizontal and the verticals will be vertical in one point perspective. So when we build on top of that and we start to go to two point perspective, here's what we're gonna start to see. So I'll show y'all how to use the ruler uh, layers here in just a moment as well. So what I want you to think about is instead of with the one point where we had all of the verticals and horizontals being all horizontal and vertical, you're gonna have the edges go to two different benching points. One will be to the left and one will be to the right. So you can see the arrows of things. The only thing in two point that's gonna stay the same as one point will be the vertical lines of the edges of objects. So we're still drawing boxes, we're still drawing cubes, but the verticals that indicate the corners are still gonna be vertical lines. But now you can see, and I'll highlight these here, you can see where uh, the left sides are now all going to that first vanishing point over here. And conversely, the right sides in green are going to the second vanishing point over here. The vanishing points, whether it's one point or two point, always have to exist on the horizon line. They can't go anywhere else. The only way you can put it on uh, another spot that's not on the horizon line is if you're changing levels. So when you're looking uphill or you're looking downhill and you're having kind of ground plane changing, um, the elevation, then you're going to have secondary uh, fake horizon lines. But that's something for another time, possibly. So here's what I'm going to do. I sketched something out earlier, and I'm just going to kind of break down how to use the ruler layers within Clip Studio specifically um, <clears throat> and how to get it across. So, you know, I drew this terrible little comic of somebody waking up, they're in a hospital bed, they're grabbing their head, um, you know, maybe they come out of the room and they're looking down the hallway, they see an open window and they're looking out and then they're in shock because they look down and there's just water or ocean underneath. And then we get a shot of, all right, they're in a floating hospital or something and the water's underneath. All of these shots are going to utilize one point perspective. And this is what I want to talk about. So there's a couple different ways to kind of do this. I'm going to drop the opacity so I can kind of see this right here and lock that. All right, so if you're doing um, burst lines or speed lines, there's a quick ways to do it. You can use this ruler tool over here. If you go to the special ruler tool, make sure it's on special ruler on right here. When you go back to the sub tool, make sure it says radial line. That's one way to do it. Um, but the other way to do it is to go to layer, ruler frame, and then create perspective ruler. 
One thing, you'll see this little pop-up menu. Make sure to hit one point perspective. And I tend to keep create new layer on. This is kind of up to you and what you're what you feel comfortable doing and your own prerogative. Um, but I like keeping my ruler separate and not actually drawing on the ruler layers um, because then it's non-destructive when I'm trying to keep my files together. So um, I'm not gonna worry about the first line, but because this is a bigger file, I need to go find the ruler. So I'm gonna go click on it and then pull it up. When you uh, go to the ruler, um, you're gonna see a little, I, I know this is small, possibly on your screen, not the vanishing point itself, but there's a little dot that's about half white and half blue. I need you to grab that and then pull that back up to where you're working, whichever panel you're working on. So I'm going to work on this panel up here where the character is grabbing their head. When you need to grab the lines themselves to kind of reposition them, grab the white dot in the center to kind of move it closer. Um, <clears throat> this, when you grab the white dots, it doesn't move the horizon line or the vanishing point. As you'll see when you click on the blue dots right next to it, when you start to hold it and swivel it, it will move your horizon line and your vanishing point. Um, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to find your horizon line. So if I'm going to turn this off, if I can see in this one where, all right, I've got the edges of the ceiling pointing down. I know that my, my horizon line is going to be somewhere underneath that. And if I know the edges of the back of this bed are going up, then the horizon line is above it. So again, think about the lines and look at the spaces in and around you. I think that is the one thing that I got from just walking around and learning the most is, you know, think about the spaces um, in your life right now. Think about your room, think about your kitchen, think about your studio, think about your office, you know, where you work, wherever you go, and look at the lines and where they're converging. Are they going up? Are they going down? Try to imagine those invisible arrows, and then you can start to find out where your horizon line is. So after I've done that, I'm going to, hold on, let me delete those. I'm going to grab my ruler, I'm going to position it, and then I'm going to use those little white dots right there and start to line them up. It's not going to be perfect because, again, this is a sketch. The perspective isn't supposed to be um, perfect in your thumbnail or your layout. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to correct things and make them feel accurate with the perspective ruler. I do want to stress this as well, and this is something, you know, just like with hopefully everything that you've learned today, is I want you to be able to mess up and not feel bad about that. A lot of the times what we're doing today and what I'm going to show you is you're going to see me mess up as well, and that's okay. This is about making the worlds feel believable and have them feel like they hold weight so that way your characters will exist in them and sit in them well. So if I'm drawing something or you're drawing something and you're starting to build things out and you're saying like, all right, here's where the ceiling is, here's where the floor is, and yada, yada, yada. It might look good, but when you go back and check it, if it's not correct, who cares? No one else is watching. It's all about the finished product. It's all about the comics and the panels that you're putting up at the end of the day. Did you correct them? Sure. How many of y'all take your first pass and you're like, this is it. I'm good. I don't need to change anything. Probably not too many of y'all. So be open to change. Be open to utilizing this as a guide first. Um, and then kind of building it out from there. So I'm laying this out and saying, all right, here's the size of the room. Maybe I'm going to put the window right there behind the figure. I'm going to put this right there. And then I'm going to start to kind of slowly build out. Again, this is rough because this isn't the final inks or anything. Here's where maybe the headboard in the back of the, the bed is. And then here's maybe the edge of the bed right there. You know, it's not perfect. But again, when I look at it, it says, okay, this room is in perspective. So that way, when I start to go to final inks, when I put the character in front, it's going to feel like they sit naturally in that bed, within that space, and it's not going to feel um, a little, it's not going to feel jarring at all, if that makes sense. All right, so I'm just going to move this down. You're doing the same kind of thing with all these different um, uh, elements down here in these different uh, environments. You're just going to find the horizon line again. Let me turn this off so you can see. 
you can see the arrows of the lines that I've laid out in the sketch are pointing down, indicating that, all right, the vanishing point is going to be somewhere down here. Where are they going to cross? This is going to come up. But again, because this is a sketch, I'm finding the floor and the ceiling lines and where they touch the walls. They're going to go up. They're probably not going to converge on the same spot, which is okay, because I'm trying to find the horizon line and I'm trying to find the vanishing point. As long as I know that these are pointing up and these are pointing down, I can kind of indicate somewhere in between where the horizon line is. So all you do after that, just like with every panel, you're going to line it up. You're going to find where the vanishing point kind of lies. You're going to kind of figure it out and ghost it in just a little bit. Maybe I'll nudge this over a little bit because it's going to feel a little bit extreme of an angle and then kind of go from there. Close enough. Um, I'm not going to build out that space because you can kind of figure out for yourself and you understand what's going to happen. You can utilize one point perspective as well to do a, for to do top down shots. I know a lot of times people use three point perspective and you can use that as well. But if you're just trying to get across um, kind of that immersive quality, you can use one point and it gets across the same kind of thing. So if in this panel, you know, the character is looking down and from these floating kind of buildings above the water, all I need to do is the same kind of thing. If they're looking down, it's just of instead of we're looking across like this, you're just taking your horizon line and your view and you're pointing it straight at your feet or straight below you. It's the same concept, it's the same kind of thing uh, trying to get across. So you're just gonna build buildings out. Again, horizontals are straight, verticals are straight. All the edges of the things are going to converge towards the vanishing point on the horizon line. And with Clip Studio, most of these um, have these kind of smart tools that snap specifically um, onto uh, the ruler. And just make sure that if you don't want it to snap to the ruler, you click the eyeball off and then you can go back to doing, you know, whatever, um, <clears throat> whatever lines you'd like to indicate that don't kind of go towards that perspective ruler. All right, so that is a lot of just one point perspective. All right, so when you go to two point, I want you to think about this. Uh, let's say this character is, you know, now walking through uh, the hospital and Maybe there's something on the ceiling. What's it gonna be? Um, maybe it's a spider. Maybe they realize they're in a cave. Who knows, um, but we can try and get that across. So because we can see, again, think about what we talked about earlier. If we're seeing this, imagine this up here as the underside to a box. If we can see the underside to a box, that means the horizon line is going to be considerably lower because we're seeing more of the underside than we normally would possibly. So knowing that when I start to build out my perspective ruler, it's going to be the same kind of thing with what I just did with one point. I'm going to go up to layer. I'm going to pop down to ruler frame and go to create perspective ruler. This time I'm going to click on two point and hit okay. But knowing what we just talked about, when I grab the perspective ruler, I'm going to keep it low. I'm going to keep it well below the picture plane or the frame right here um, because I know I'm seeing a lot of the underside of this hypothetical cube, which is the ceiling. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to line stuff up, grab the blue dot and kind of swivel it to see where it might go. And I'm going to line these up with some of these other lines as well. And then I'm going to do the same thing with these other lines going in the other direction. And maybe I'll pull it a little bit further down. Again, they're not going to be lining up exactly because I'm going on a sketch where I don't know the perspective yet and I'm just trying to figure it out. So again, remember to be okay with you messing up multiple times. I do this literally every time I approach a page or do a comic, it's going to be me auto correcting or correcting and kind of um you know realigning because it'll look good and then i'm going to say to myself oh wait this is way off so don't beat yourself up about this just understand like it's a learning process that's what you're here for and that's what we're talking about so after i've done this i'm going to drop the opacity of the sketch just so i can see i'm going to leave the eyeball on the perspective ruler right here so that way i know it's going to snap 
And then I can just do this. I'm gonna pull lines down and say, all right, here's the edge of the ceiling. And then much like, I don't know, most ceilings, maybe it's squared off or something. And I'm just gonna indicate it like that. Maybe I'll put a door frame over here. And again, because the horizon line is underneath the picture plane, we're gonna see actually the underside of that door frame. Maybe I'll extend out into the room where this, let's say this door is open. I'm gonna use a lighter shade. So now when I turn the sketch off, I can see, all right, there's a room. I haven't placed the figure yet. It isn't fully inked, but you can get a clear indication of, all right, this person is standing there. We're probably close up on them. And maybe there's something creeping up behind them. There's a reason why we're kind of looking up at them. Just like I was talking about with one point, you can place a figure um, or place the horizon line above the picture plane, kind of going in reverse of what we just talked about. So I'm going to actually use the same um, ruler right here, and I'm just going to pull this way up. I'm going to turn off this other layer so we don't get confused um, as I'm applying this to the second panel right here. Um, so let's say we've got this figure kind of standing on the edge. Maybe they're on the rooftop of one of these buildings. We can see kind of the water below and these other floating buildings around. And we need to indicate just how high up those buildings are away from an ocean. Um, so I'm going to do that same thing. I'm going to pull the horizon line way up because this time, if this is a floating building, I'm seeing the top edge of a building. If I'm seeing, again, more of it, it means the horizon line is going to be further up away from that object and from that element that I'm trying to indicate. So again, I'm going to grab some of these. I'm going to use that white dot in the center and then the blue dot over here. And I'm going to swivel these out. I'm going to hold it down until it kind of lines up, kind of looks pretty good with what I indicated in my sketch, um, and then kind of go from there. The higher up you move this, the more extreme the angle will be, the more you're gonna see the top of something and the more depth you're gonna create. So that looks pretty good. So when I start to rough this in, let's say they're right on this edge right there, but let's say there's another floating building over here. Again, not the most incredible looking buildings, but I'm not doing finished art right now. I'm just trying to get down the shapes and the forms. So if I'm trying to show kind of a depth or how far away they are from um, the water or where they're floating above, I'm just actually going to draw extra lines down. Um, and I'm going to say, all right, this is how far they are off of the water. I'm just going to pull the lines down. So that way I can get a good idea of how much I'd like to indicate them off of the thing. I'm never going to draw that in the final inks. I'm just going to utilize that and say, all right, if I know that's the case, I'm going to turn my ruler off. I'm going to turn the sketch off for just a minute. If I need to indicate water down here, if these are, let's say, hypothetically blowing, you know, steam or whatever, I can do kind of smoke or water or kind of steam around to help indicate where uh, the, you know, the layer or the amount of steam or propulsion is coming out of uh, these buildings. And I can indicate it in such a way where when I start to get rid of where it indicated the actual gap, it gives across that feeling before you kind of go to colors, if you're coloring your work. You can look at that and say, all right, I have a good idea of how far off the ground this is possibly going to be or how much away from uh, the, the water it's going to be as well, if that makes sense. All right, so that's kind of about two points perspective. I'm going to show you a little bit more here in just a moment, but I want to take a break just for a touch and talk specifically about the figure. This is an important thing because it has to deal with specifically how your figures interact within your spaces. So the anatomically correct person, uh, for the most part, or what we've always been taught and learned is most people are roughly seven and a half to eight heads tall. 
I want you to think specifically about benchmarks on your figure or on your person. So if we are eight heads tall, from the top of your head to your chin is one. There's other benchmarks that are kind of go-tos, and it's good to know to kind of help speed up the process when you're trying to think about uh, objects within your space. So outside of the bottom of your chin, the next kind of step down is your nipples. Uh, after that is your navel or your belly button. And then about your halfway point is right, right, excuse me, right where your crotch is. So from the top of your head to your crotch is about the halfway point on your person. And then from your crotch to the bottom of your feet is the other half of your person. So you're probably saying to yourself, why am I learning about this or why do I care? This has nothing to do with perspective. So here's what I'm going to say to you. Um, let's say we're just drawing this dude and, you know, he's on his phone. Um, I want you to think about specifically how big you are and your person is in relation to everyday objects in every, you know, every room. Every room has to have a door because how else would you get into that room? Other elements inside specific rooms are kind of clear indications to get across the size and the scale of a room. A lot of what we do with perspective is going to be about math, but the way to kind of uh, cheat that math is talk about the spatial relationship between a figure to the elements within the space to build out the scale and proportion of the space. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment and kind of back up for a second. So when you look at me here in my room right here, I'm about 5'10", 5'11". When I back up to my door right back here, you can see where my head comes up right here. You can see that there's, you know, a little bit more than one head's height from the top of my head to the top of the door frame. Most doors are roughly about seven feet tall. So if you know that, you can do a clear indication of, all right, if there's an average sized person or what is supposed to be an average sized person, um, you know, you know to put a little bit more than a head's height above to kind of clearly indicate the size of the door. Once you know the size of the door, then you can kind of figure out, all right, how many doors width are within a room? A door's width is dependent on if it's an interior or exterior door. An exterior door will be about three feet across. Interior doors will drastically vary. Um, you can kind of build out the size of a room and think about it that way. Um, and it's just an easier way so you don't have to worry about how am I doing this with math involved. All right, so let me go back to sharing my screen. After this workshop and after this weekend, you know, take notes and jot these things down. Put it in your sketchbook, put it wherever you go, put it on your phone in your notes, but walk around and say to yourself, all right, how big am I and my person to some of these everyday objects? So when you start to do that, you're going to start to understand like, all right, one head taller, that'll help me find the doorway. After that, what are other things that I can figure out where they kind of lie on me as a person and how that'll help inform my figures within the spaces I'm trying to get across. So when you think about it, how big is your desk? Like stand up if you're sitting at your desk and where does it come up to you on a figure? So for my desk, I know y'all can't probably see it, but it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit higher. Um, it's probably between my navel and my crotch. Um, where's your bed kind of laying on your figure? Does it come up to, you know, it probably doesn't come up too high. And how low is it going? Is it sitting on the floor? Do you have a low bed? Do you have a high bed? You can say a lot with kind of where the orientation and the positioning of different elements, such as your bed or your desk, go up against your figure. So if you've got beds that are kind of raised up higher, if they're coming up to mid chest, you might assume that they could be a bed seen in a dorm room. You might be putting bookshelves or cases underneath that bed, because if I only saw a bed in a corner and it was raised up, and a figure walked in and it came up to about right here, it's safe to assume that maybe this is in a dorm room as opposed to just a bed on a floor. So think about some of these different things because it will help inform um, just the perspective of everything you're trying to get across. Outside of doors, windows are other things that just really help inform you as an artist and a creator to say how big a figure is within a space and it'll help your perspective as well with your windows that can tell you a lot in a very short amount of time. 
if you've got a small rectangular window and let's say it comes up to your collarbone and it goes possibly above your head like this and it's oriented in the top of a room what is that telling you about the space it's telling you all right this character is probably in a basement or maybe they're in a cellar something like that if you've got a small window and someone's standing in front of it maybe it's not very big maybe it's very short very squat you might assume that they're in a bathroom or they're in a workshop so the scale and the size of windows as well can be clear indicators to say where somebody is without showing the whole room i mention this because a lot of what y'all do is you know it's based in the vertical format which means you're utilizing establishing shots but after that it's a character driven format so you're still implementing perspectives and backgrounds but how are you saying a lot with little? I think when you think about some of the elements within the space and how it orients and kind of positions are in and around your figures within your shot choices, it can kind of get a lot across in a very short amount of time. All right, so another quick cheat I wanted to talk about is this method where you can kind of hang characters uh, on certain benchmarks and they will recede into perspective. So here is a terrible little drawing of myself, just waving at all of you. Um, hello, hope it's a nice weekend. But what we're gonna talk about is how you can kind of line them up in space using perspective. So let's say I want to draw myself further back here. Let's say this is where I want their feet to go, and I need to figure out how big and how kind of how they're going to scale down as we go. So one thing you can do is just straight up, I'm going to copy and then paste this figure. And then I'm going to put them right here. I'm going to shrink them down. And I'm going to say, all right, this feels pretty good. I don't yet know the space yet, but I'm just trying to get it all across. So what you can see is already they're not lining up you need to find the exact spots where the figures are lining up. And this has only to do when you're using characters that are the same size. So if you're doing crowd scenes or if you're doing something where um, it's a repetitive kind of figure trying to be repeated over and over again, you want to make sure that they line up on the horizon line in scale on the same places. So if we're doing that, it needs to be right here within that figure so what i need to do is i need to shrink this character in the background so it lines up exactly like we're seeing right here so after you do that what you can do is i'm going to create a perspective ruler i'm going to do two point again just because it's easier that way i'm going to pull this up to the horizon line where i've already indicated and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to align these dots up so that they hit the top of their heads. So I'm gonna grab this. I'm gonna make sure this hits the top of his head and this hits the top of his head. And then I'm gonna make sure that their feet line up as well. Where do I, hold on. Yeah, whatever. I'm gonna move these other vanishing points out here. But what you can do and what I'm about to show you as well is I've already indicated kind of uh, where the vanishing points are going and doing, and I want to maybe put somebody else out over here. So what I would do is I am going to copy that dude again, paste him in again, and now I'm going to shrink him down so that his feet and at the top of his head line up with that. And then when I zoom in, you could see the horizon line lines up in the exact same spot. Uh, let me turn off the lure. In the exact same spot, in the exact same spot. This is something, it's a quick thing to do, so you can make sure that characters will uh, recede into the distance and feel natural, and it won't feel um, like things are uh, scaling differently and weird, if that makes sense. So when you're doing this, you can, like I was just showing you, you can line them up. You're making sure that the top of their heads are going to the same vanishing points, their feet as well. You can add more 
and you can indicate as such like we were just doing. Again, if you've got to do crowd scenes, if you've got to figure out how big a space is, this is just a quick way, an easy way to kind of find, um, you know, making sure that you're scaling things and making it feel immersive within your panels and your drawings. But you need to make sure that when you're doing this, the horizon line comes up to the same kind of benchmark that you've established on your baseline figure for all the other figures in that space. Let me turn the ruler off and then go to the next one. All right, so I laid out a, just a little sketch right here. It's just, you know, an exterior of like a street corner. Um, but what I wanted to show you was starting to block the figures. This is building on what we just talked about, but I'm applying the background first, and then I want the figures to feel like they sit within the space clearly. So I utilized the ruler layer, and then I started to block it out. I just use them as guides. Again, when you're doing this with perspective, I'm just blocking out the shapes. I can see that, all right, this is the crosswalk, here's the sidewalk, here's a door, here's a window, here's an awning to a street or a, or a shop. Here's like a telephone pole with a crosswalk thing. It's not final art, and that's okay because I'm not going for final art yet. I put some background buildings just to indicate that and make sense. I'm going to turn off the sketch so I can kind of see this. And I'm also going to turn off the ruler for a minute. So I've established this little person right here. Again, not an amazing drawing, but I'm just using this as a baseline to say, all right, I've established that I know it's going to be this setting. It's going to be outside of, you know, a deli or a pet shop. Those are two drastically different things, but whatever. Um, or a bookstore or whatever. I've got this baseline figure, and now what I'm going to try to do is I want to scale it. I want other figures to be in the space, and I want to make sure it feels natural. I want to make sure it's not this person is this size, and there's a giant ogre across the street. Maybe that's what you're trying to go for, but you want to make sure that the ogre feels as big or feels as small as you're trying to go for. If this is the same size person, you're going to do what we just talked about. You're going to find those other vanishing points that you used for your background. When I zoom out, you can see there's one vanishing point over here and one over here. The horizon line is established. And all I did was I took lines and went from the top of their head and the bottom of their feet. I did it this way and I did it this way into the distance. And then you just applied that. So that way, if the same size person is across the street, this is how big they're going to be. If they're coming closer towards us in the foreground with the crosswalk, this is where they're going to be. There is one thing to be mindful of because this person, the baseline one, is standing on a sidewalk and there's this little bit of a dip right here. I would probably compensate for that and drop this figure walking across just down so that way we know that there is a step up and they're going to change. All right, so the other thing I wanted to indicate with this is talking about utilization of other vanishing points in two-point perspective or one-point perspective on the same horizon line. And I'm not trying to overwhelm you, but I'm trying to get across that. When you look around your room, when you go outside, when you go anywhere, nothing is ever going to be lined up specifically, perfectly, all going to one vanishing point. I'm trying to think of a scenario where that could be, even in a library, even in a bookstore, um, even in a warehouse, there's going to be boxes. There's going to be things that are slanted, tilted, or kind of skewed, pushed to the side. When you look around your own room, you're probably seeing that as well. So you want to remember if you can establish other vanishing points, and they're still going to be on the same horizon line. So let me take out this figure for a second. No, there's the figure. All right. So originally, this is the ruler layer. These are the two vanishing points and they line up on the horizon line. I put another vanishing or another two vanishing points also on the horizon line and you can see them right here. What I did was I just drew boxes as if they fell off a delivery truck. They still feel like they exist in that space because they still go to the same horizon line. If I wanted to do this again, all I'm going to do is, all right, let's say I'm going to go up, <clears throat> create a new ruler, do another two point, and it's the same kind of thing. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to put it on that horizon line again, 
and I'm going to move these dots and I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to put these over here. These are going to be different than some of the other ones. And then I'm just going to go like that. So when I zoom in, and let me use a different color so we can see this. There's other boxes sitting here on the foreground as well. Or maybe they're behind some of the other ones. So when you zoom out, it starts to look like they're all kind of skewing and turning and shifting and tilting. They still feel like they fit and they sit on that ground plane because they do because they're all going to the same vanishing or not the same vanishing points the same horizon line as the other boxes and the other backgrounds that's how you kind of make your world start to feel even more lived in is when you start to create elements that are going to different vanishing points on the same horizon line it will add more character it will add more flavor and it will make it feel less like that stock kind of this is room this is school this is, you know, whatever. It's not you just slapping it in. It's you building on top of it and adding a little bit more. So that way your characters will resonate that much more in the world. All right. So speaking of your vanishing points, something to be mindful of as well is the spacing of your vanishing points. More so when you're using two point, this is extremely important. So good spacing means that they're pretty far apart or at least one is further apart um, and wider and further away from the picture plane or your panel border. It's okay to have one closer inside, but if that's the case, the other one needs to compensate for it and be further out. So with this one, if you've got this character kind of going around a corner and looking over their shoulder, you need to make sure that the corner doesn't feel too extreme. With the vanishing points further out, it feels like, all right, here's one plane and one side of the alley, and here is the other. When you put them too close, this is what starts to happen, and this is something that you want to avoid. When you, and I can show you where the vanishing points are. So you can see them right here. Let me drop the opacity. You can see the vanishing points are right here. Here's the first one, and there's the second because they're both so close to the edge of the frame, you start to see this warping and the skewing. It's gonna make everything feel condensed. It's gonna make everything start to feel um, just too tight and almost um, create a three point, but that's not accurate three point perspective. All right, so the last thing, and I'm trying, well, this isn't the last thing, but something I want to get across, and I'm not trying to trick you with math again, but, um, it's the quick hack to kind of find how you can get to a halfway point and indicate a halfway point without actually having to measure it out. When you're doing it by hand, you can measure it out, it's fine. Um, but this is a trick that you can do digitally to kind of get something across real clearly and real quick. So let's say, for example, you just need to find a halfway point of something. Let's say it's this rectangle. The first thing you wanna do is pull a line from corner to corner. You wanna create an X. When you do that, it's this center dot that's going to be the halfway point, both vertically and horizontally. So when you do that, let's say, for example, you're doing, I don't know, a fence or a bunch of billboards being kind of posted up uh, on a walkway or just trying to do anything that's going to be repeated over and over and over again. If it's going to be across, you want to pull that horizontal line all the way across. If it's something where you're trying to stack things vertically, you need to pull the line vertically above you. After you've done that, and this is where it starts to get tricky, and I'll walk through this. So you're trying to find the next spot. From here to here, you're trying to say, all right, how can I repeat this same size and get it over here? So the way to do that is like this. You're going to essentially, you're gonna go right here into this corner and then you're gonna go right here to this corner where the half line is right there. You're gonna pull a straight line down through both of those lines and just extend it out. When you do that, this is what happens. 
you pull the line down and now you can see this is going to be where the the vertical or the horizontal is going to pull and the vertical is going to go so that way you can see that these are going to be equally repattern um, equally repeating pattern and shapes um, after you've done that once you don't have to kind of do the x again because you've already indicated the halfway point through the horizontal line you just need to go from up here through that vertical or that horizontal line again and find where it's going to repeat so the nice part is is that you can also do this in perspective all you're doing is the same concept if you establish the horizon line and you put a vanishing point down all you're going to do is first do the x across and then when you find that middle point you're going to go from that middle point to the vanishing point that is going to create um, the halfway point as it recedes into the distance to the vanishing point that is on the horizon line. And then after that, all you're doing is the same thing. You're going from up here through that halfway point and extending it down. And then you draw the vertical line and then you go from right here through that halfway point and extend it down. It's just this repeating pattern. And you can see that while these are receding into the distance and they are getting smaller, these are all equal to one another in shape because they're scaling down in perspective towards the horizon line. All right, so let's say for example, again, here's a terrible drawing of a library, but I use this as an example to say, all right, uh, I'm thinking about drawing something with double doors in the front. What are some buildings that have double doors? Uh, libraries, hospitals, grocery stores, churches, whatever else we need to come up with. I'm going to keep this simple. The first thing I'm going to do is just make a square like this. Uh, this is just going to be the front of the, the front facing of the library itself. Just like what we were doing, I'm going to find and create that X across. Sorry, this is so faint. Let me make that a little bit bigger. I'm gonna find the vertical line and the horizontal. So now that I've found the halfway point, I'm just going to kind of build one door and put it to the halfway point. And then you're doing the same thing. All you're doing is building that X again. Gonna go across. And then there we go. Now we know how big the doors are. We know they're smack dab in the center of this wall or this plane. And now we can also use this if we wanted to as a vanishing point and a horizon line if the, the lines indicate as such. Um, I'm not gonna kind of go through this, but I wanted to talk specifically about, you know, the different shop choices real quick with, when you're using uh, perspective. So if I've got this person being chased here, uh, I'm gonna use one point. Um, if I'm doing a top down, um, something to remember when you're using perspective, if you're doing top down, um, something where the figure appears smaller. It's giving off that indication of you, the viewer, are the one necessarily kind of looking down at them. You are the one in that kind of seat of power or looking down at them. They're the one kind of tripping over the trash can running for their life because, you know, you are above the picture plane. You are above the horizon line looking down at them. When the horizon line is above or, you know, like you're looking up like this, then you're creating a threat because something is above you and they are looking down at you, if that makes sense. It's just a good indication and a good thing to remember when you're trying to utilize things narratively and perspective narratively. Um, say to yourself, where's the figure, where's the background, and how am I taking that into my composition and my shot choice to help indicate um, not just what's going on in each panel, but how I'm trying to pace things out. So when you're doing down shots and up shots, if you're doing chase scenes and action scenes, you want to pair them back and forth to kind of give that jarring effect and that threat of, all right, something is chasing me, looking up. 
I'm the one kind of running, I'm being kind of shot from a downward angle to just kind of get that across. Same kind of thing. I'm not going to go through this, but you can see like, all right, there's this person running, they trip and fall. There's like a giant spider chasing them. And then we can kind of see them getting pulled away, that kind of thing. And then a giant spider chomps down on them. Uh, the last thing I did want to mention is this. So with perspective, it is all about the relationship of your figures to the backgrounds as well. Um, so I know you all have your own aesthetics, your own kind of design, your styles, and sometimes it's not necessarily going to be eight heads tall uh, for your characters to your world. But again, like I mentioned earlier, think about your own life and what you do in your own free time and kind of the elements around you. Take notes. Even if your characters, like this character right here, is maybe they're five or six heads tall, to find kind of where their crotch area is, which would be the halfway point normally, but then their lower torso, their, or their lower half is only maybe gonna be three or four heads. Obviously it's not gonna be a halfway point, but think about those benchmarks. Use the benchmarks instead of the head um, kind of breakdown to say, all right, I want this character with this style that I'm going for to feel believable in my world and in my space. I know that most dining room tables come up to this part on a figure. I know that most doors will come up to maybe one head or a little bit more on a figure to make it feel believable. How are other elements, you know, beds, couches, bookshelves, how are they going to interact with your characters and your styles to make them feel natural and make them feel real? Please take uh, into account some of those things because I think it'll just make your world feel more natural and your characters will exist a lot better within them. And that is about it for what I'm gonna to talk to y'all about today. Kirsten, was there anything that stuck out to you that y'all thought I should answer? Oh my goodness, yes. There were some great questions that popped up a little while ago. Let me pull those up for you. Um, but I wanna say this was an incredible workshop today, Hunter. Thank you so much. <laughs> this was awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the great questions that was asked is if there are certain types of types of perspective that work well with the mood of certain scenes, uh, for example, horror scenes, romance scenes, things like that. Do you have any tips on choosing perspective intentionally for a scene? Okay. Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> I would say when you're doing horror, think about, um, the actual, where your horizon line is. Um, because again, like I just mentioned with the kind of the last two slides, if a character is looking down, it means that the horizon line is lower, which means we're going to see more of them looking down at us. Um, and if you're doing a threat, if a monster or a character or someone being chased is supposed to come across threatening, the horizon line will be lower because they're going to be looking down at us because they're going to be in that, essentially, they are in that powerful position and we are in kind of the vulnerable position. The other kind of thing you can use to your advantage is implementing that, but also taking your horizon line and swiveling it. It's what they call a Dutch shot. Um, when you do that, it creates this extra sense of engagement and immersion within your art. It's a small thing, but if you think about it, what we do as humans and people is we're constantly trying to solve puzzles. Think about it when you read something or you consume anything, whether you realize it or not, you're always trying to kind of figure it out. And a lot of it is enjoying the process but it's those little things that you can use to trick the reader or kind of slow them down. And one way is to swivel the horizon line. It's a slight thing, but you know you do this. Everybody does this. If you know you position something slightly to the side, we're all naturally gonna kind of lean our head this way or lean our head that way. It creates a little bit of extra engagement. Um, and with horror specifically, you want to pull somebody in and you want to keep them in that moment. Oh my gosh, those were great tips. That, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Hunter, yeah. we were so impressed by today's presentation. I know that our creators really appreciated your insights. Um, a lot of them were, you know, really, I think it, it looked like you were working magic at some points, especially yeah. live drawing in front of us. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sure. Please, everyone, join me in thanking uh, Professor Clark today for his time in, in sharing his knowledge. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the other thing. Let me know if y'all do have other questions at some point. Uh, y'all can find me online, but yeah, reach out. I'm usually pretty open and willing to share, so just holler at me. Mm -hmm.